Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, thank you for having me here today and a warm welcome to all our Australian colleagues to cold New Zealand. Um, today I'd like to present lessons I've learnt from a paper exercise, um, seemingly dull and boring but of which greatly enhanced my understanding um, and interest in public health. So today I'll briefly talk to what the exercise was about, uh, the competency elements I'll be addressing, uh, my project itself, a whistle stop tour, um, with reflections, what I call lessons throughout, and you'll see these in the yellow script um, throughout my presentation. So as a part of my fourth year public health project, we had to conceptualize, create, critique, and critically appraise our very own study. Um, and this was quite daunting for me, this was the first time I had done this, uh, indeed. Um, but what I wanna do today is talk to you about how this taught me to, how, um, to think, how to think like a public health researcher um, and I'll go through my thought processes with you as I sort of Indiana Jones it around the pitfalls when I, when I could. Um, yeah, and so, so no breathtaking new statistics for you, but an excellent epidemiological experience um, if that spurs you on. So the competency elements, um, mainly under 3.2.2, which is designed sound observational epidemiological studies. Um, so it fits nicely under there. Um, however, I do touch on other competency elements such as that uh, above there too. So the title of my study was Can Practicing Dentistry in Low Socioeconomic Areas uh, Increase the Risk of Developing Depression, a cohort study here in New Zealand. Um, so this looked at the issue of mental health within dental practitioners across uh, different social climates. Um, and it'll be impossible to explore everything today, but we can come back to that afterwards if we need. So what do we know? Uh, we know that evidence shows that general dentistry has an increased risk of burnout, anxiety disorders, and clinical depression. Uh, risk factors such as predominant type A personalities and stressful working conditions contribute, with the media capitalizing on this, publicizing that dentists as a profession have the number one suicide rate. Um, depression is the most common affective disorder, um, with affecting about over 10% um, of the population. Uh, that's huge socioeconomic inequalities highlighted in the National Mental Health Survey showed that um, there were consistently higher prevalences in the most deprived areas. Um, however, I found no evidence linking um, where they worked um, and their mental health outcomes. So this was very much uh, a new study. The objective, my aim was in New Zealand, does practicing dentistry in low socioeconomic status or SES areas increase the risk of developing depression um, as opposed to others? And my hypothesis was yes, this does. So one of the most important parts of any study, um, I realized was the design itself due to its many inherent strengths and weaknesses. Um, like rooms, it depends what you want. I wanted my study to be able to have temporal association, uh, minimize differential reporting and memory issues in participants, uh, especially in those with any mood disturbance, um, as well as being able to measure multiple exposures. So I chose a cohort of about five years. Um, with case control and retrospective cohorts, there would be memory issues and recall bias, as well as matching and case recruitment difficulties and no temporality. An RCT wouldn't be appropriate and case control, well, not as effective. Um, so with a cohort, I was uh, pretty pleased. Um, but when I pitched the idea to my lecturer, he retaliated with, uh, who's gonna do and pay for all this? What if the participants move away, retire, forget, or trip to the Bahamas when I require surveys to be done? Uh, luckily for me, I was a millionaire with epidemiologists behind me, but it did leave more to be desired. So I learned that no study design is ever perfect. Um, and it depends on the topic, a suitable method and feasibility. Um, and they, they all come into play as well as efficiency. Um, and understanding of the study des design um, helped me to um, really be able to interpret um, other studies and inform future research and statistics as well. So it doesn't stop there though. Study design is a hob whole um, process. And my eligible population were dentists from the New Zealand Dental Association, um, which provides a near complete record about 96% of New Zealand registered um, general dentists, equaling about 2,500. Um, and as a researcher, you must enlist help when required, and I use the RALSOF statistical software to pr predict a sample size of about 250 to 300 participants, giving about less than 5% uh, margin of error. Um, also, in the night surrounding the project, uh, many what-ifs entered my mind. 
Um, what if they forgot? What if they had a mental issue already? And what if they were a prosthodontist? Would these things affect the study? Um, and bottom line is, yes, they would. Um, eventually, these what ifs became my exclusion criteria and my recruitment protocol, and I learnt from here that the what ifs really do matter, um, especially in public health. So measures are extremely pivotal um, to the research method. My exposure was SES and outcome was risk of developing depression. I used the standardised NZDEP 2006 tool to measure SES, which um, uses many variables and mesh blocks to determine a 1 to 10 decile rating. Um, so great, that's uh, easy, I thought. Um, but when it came to specifying what really is being measured, I fell short. Was it the practice address, um, the average patient SES, or where the dentist actually lived? Um, each would impact on results greatly. For instance, a low SES practice with mainly high SES clientele would be categorised differentially depending on the definitions. Um, so I decided to go with a practice address because I thought that would most closely correlate with clientele, but I did ask for some more qualitative data into the dentist to describe what um, their patient um, SES was to their opinion. Um, the outcome was measured using the BDI-PC, which is the Best Depression Inventory for Primary Healthcare. Um, and this is a commonly used quick standardised survey with 97% sensitivity and 99% specificity. Um, the practical issues that need to be dealt with here include the title, um, so you'd have to blind participants to that, calling it something more, on, more along the lines of mental health, or oh, general health survey, um, and the time of survey because the, the time when you do it, the season, the day, does affect mood. Um, and confounding variable information would also be embedded, including um, qualitative questions, as I've mentioned. Um, so what I really took home from this part of the project was what really is being measured and how am I doing this, rather than just slotting in survey and NZ depth, um, which would be easy answers. So a brush over graphic representation. Um, so this is an example of how I would tabulate scores with deprivation on the side there and uh, baseline and five-year scores along the top and from this I could um, calculate relative risks. Um, table 2 shows table of other characteristics and potential confounding factors. So as examples there I've got recent bereavements, age, ethnicity, etc. Um, and uh, as an example of graphing differences between baseline um, in five years as shown here. Um, and before you jump at me, yes, here are all the potential sources of error um, and <coughs> anything that influences results. Um, whilst this isn't an epi lecture, a big part of study design is thinking about all that is against you, really. And as examples, um, you have to think about loss to follow up. I'd have to send out reminders and um, collect multiple contact details to, to be able to um, to try and mitigate this. Financial issues with buying the questionnaire and distributing this also need to be thought about and ethical implications of those who you find who are at high risk, you know, what are you gonna do there? Um, so you do need to think broadly and um, I've got there, public health is about thinking broadly because of all these extra things and contextual factors. So my project had public health relevance towards dentist wellbeing across New Zealand. Uh, this pilot study would inform us to see whether mental health is associated with working in different social climates, which could impact upon delivery of health care to patients. Um, it, it would inform the dental school to perhaps take action in training phases, spreading awareness or teaching coping mechanisms regarding difficulties, um, or even establishment of further research projects into specific factors which may cause these trends. Um, moreover, this task of study design, though, has wider implications of public health relevance. It has now taught me the building blocks of study design, such as structure, participants, um, outcomes, weakness, and bias, and I hope to take these forward into, you know, any further research um, that I do, or even um, to help me interpret studies in, a cl in the clinical field. Um, I've learned that designing studies um, is infinitely more difficult than what you first thought. Um, and you run into practical and analytical crises every step of the way. Um, and I've learned research in public health is very different to other fields. You know, people aren't all um, rats from the same mother or um, live in petri dishes, so you do need to think um, outside the square. Um, I've got there, lastly, public health um, relies on study design skills, um, and it's really about thinking versus knowing. Um, because without them, we wouldn't have a 
good basis to argue for plain packaging for cigarettes or for liquor bans in um, public areas. Um, as much as many of the students didn't really enjoy this paper exercise, for me it really honed in on um, targeting thinking about the intricate difficulties that you have in developing a study rather than just waffling around a potential good study idea, which I know medical students can do um, quite well and then when, when we get questioned, um, you know, it's, it's a bit more difficult. So I think that taking all these learnings, um, which have been coming up on the slides, um, is, is something that I'm going to take forward. Um, so in final reflections, um, my project is not perfect, nor ever will be, but um, learning the skills to patch a ship full of holes was best you can, um, was, the, was the true reward here. Acknowledgements, um, references, and those are the lessons I learned from the paper exercise. Thanks. Thank you very much, Thomas, and I've been told that we are recording, so if you've got questions, could you please put your hand up and, and you'll need to speak into this mic so that we can record the questions as well as the answers. Thanks, Tom. That's very good. Um, the thing that I was, in setting up the paper exercise, um, it, do you think it would be useful to, to look at uh, whether there's workforce data uh, of other professional groups or other groups of people working with disadvantaged communities that might have helped you to refine your hypothesis? Uh -huh. So just clarifying in terms of mental health or just any sort of health outcome? Uh, well, in particular, I mean, for mental health outcomes, I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's other professional groups like nurses and doctors and um, various health workers who work with disadvantaged communities and there might be a literature uh, from those workforces that might have helped you to refine or think about dentists in particular. Do you, um, was that an aspect of thinking through your method? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, and other healthcare workers could be experiencing similar, thing, experiencing similar things due to just being in a clinical nature or a clinical field. Um, I didn't specifically look at across um, all the different um, health professions. I did look at medicine for a bit. Um, and when it came to uh, media sort of focusing on that increased suicide risk, um, I realized that there were a few studies which actually showed that medical doctors actually had um, a similar risk. And it was increased, it wasn't blown out of proportion. Um, but it was there as well. Um, talking to multidisciplinary teams um, is a really important thing. Um, I talked to um, members of the dental faculty, um, the final year dental students, dental associations, um, and uh, they, they did um, also have concerns over their mental health. Um, mm. and, and also looking at prior potential studies on mental health and dental practitioners was probably the most useful thing. Um, there was a big JADIS study, which was the um, Journal of American Dental Association, which looked at over 3,500 dentists, and they, uh, they showed about 30% increased risk of anxiety, burnout, or a loss of concentration, all those things associated um, with dentistry. So whether that's to do with other health professions or not, um, could be explored, but um, looking at prior data of dental research um, is probably the priority there. Great. No, thanks very much, Tom. Thank you. Hi, Thomas. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Very good. Um, you've realised uh, how difficult it is, obviously, to design a, a study. I just wondered if it has affected um, your appreciation or the way that you critique or read um, other published studies. Mm -hmm. No, no, definitely, definitely. Um, and I think I can speak on behalf of my colleagues as well um, that we have this greater understanding after having done it. It's, it's quite easy in second and third year to be able to, well, relatively easy to pull apart studies and say, well, why didn't you do this? Or it could have been done better. This is a rubbish study. Um, but when you actually do it um, and you, you figure out how difficult it is and that nothing can ever be perfect, um, that's when you gain, you know, first-hand appreciation of um, what it's like to be a researcher. Yeah. 
So, um, Thomas, you mentioned um, something about, well, what would you do if you found that people were depressed? And I was wondering what you thought were some of the points that you might need to build into such a study if you were really doing it. Um, presumably the data are de-identified, but what would you do if you found out that someone was really depressed and perhaps suicidal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, there are, so there, this is sort of a multi-layered question of, you know, um, down the track interventions, but straight away, once you have recognised that someone's at increased risk, um, how do you go about that? And I think um, from, well, first of all, um, to be able to get authentic data, we would assure that this is confidential, we're not gonna go to the council on them, it's not gonna affect their practice in any way, um, to be able to get authentic responses. Um, and after that, if they, you know, then, then, they, then we recognize it, um, we'd have to probably offer support, um, potentially um, recommending CBT, um, counseling, um, and we could do this in conjunction with the NZDA, which is an association which um, wholeheartedly supports uh, their members as well. Um, so I think, I think we can recommend we can't force anything to happen. We can't go to the psychiatrist and say, you must see this person, they're not fit. Um, I don't think that's our role, but um, I think we can strongly recommend um, to them what to do. Um, in terms of interventions down the track, I mean, that's, that's a whole other few slides really, um, which I've highlighted, but I can talk about if you move, but it might take a wee bit longer. <laughs>